Okay, uh, got a lot to cover, so we're gonna get started. Hi, uh, my name's Diego. I work at CoreOS, and I'm here to talk to you about self-hosted Kubernetes. So CoreOS, we use self-hosted Kubernetes in our enterprise Kubernetes distribution, which is called Tectonic. We've been doing this for quite a while now in production with lots of customers, customers doing this, and we think it's the best way to run, uh, to run Kubernetes. So this talk, I'm just gonna kind of try to prove that to all of you. So who is this talk for? Well, a lot of different people. First would be cluster operators. If you're running a cluster, maintaining a cluster, multiple clusters, upgrading them, self-hosted Kubernetes is one approach you can take that we think is a good one that will make your life easier in a lot of dimensions I'll get into. Also, if you're a Kubernetes contributor, you're just interested in Kubernetes, Self-hosted Kubernetes touches on a lot of interesting aspects of Kubernetes API, Surface, and things like that. We hit a lot of kind of corner cases we had to solve. So it's, 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 it's cool from a Kubernetes point of view just to see Kubernetes running itself. And lastly, people who enjoy clever hacks. So we had to come up with a couple of neat tricks in order to make self-hosted Kubernetes work that I'll get into during this talk. And so I think they're kind of cool, and hopefully you do too. So first, to get everyone on the same page, I want to talk about what is self-hosted Kubernetes. Well, it's somewhat self-evident, but it's Kubernetes running on Kubernetes. Specifically, all of the Kubernetes control plane components are running as native Kubernetes objects, namely deployments, daemon sets. They're using things like secrets. And that's about it in terms of what it actually is. But of course, the devil's in the details, right? So this talk is gonna come in three parts. First, I'm gonna talk about why you'd wanna use self-hosted Kubernetes. I'm gonna make the case for why we think this is the best way to run uh, Kubernetes. Then I'm gonna get into how it works, and I'm actually gonna launch a self-hosted cluster and show you guys some of the ins and outs of it and uh, some, some of these tricks I was talking about to make it work. And at the end of the talk, I wanna get into what's next for self-hosting. So we have self-hosting self today, it's working great but it also unlocks a lot of possibilities for what you can do once you have a self-hosted cluster and doing some pretty sophisticated stuff in terms of managing your cluster, scaling it up, that sort of thing. And so I'll touch on that in the end. So first, let's go over why you'd want to self-host a Kubernetes cluster. Well, first of all, you want to leverage Kubernetes strengths. We have Kubernetes. It's great at running highly available, resilient software. Wouldn't be great if we could actually run Kubernetes taking advantage of all of that useful stuff that's encoded in Kubernetes. Secondly, it really simplifies your node management story. So it turns out once you're using self-hosted Kubernetes, your node requirements are very simple, and I'll describe that a little bit. Lastly, it really makes your cluster lifecycle management a lot easier because you're managing using the same lifecycle management tools that you use when you're managing any application on Kubernetes, you know, kubectl and friends like that. So if you're running a Kubernetes control plane, what might be some properties that you'd like this control plane to have? Well, for, for one thing, you might want it to scale it up and down automatically. Let's say your cluster's growing, you're getting more users, more people are hitting the Kubernetes API. You might want to scale up the number of API servers you're running or controller managers or so on. You also might want to handle node failures gracefully. So let's say one of your masters goes down you want to quickly bring up, bring up another master to run the components that were running on that failed node so that you don't have any downtime, so that you'd, you'd, your work, workloads keep running. You also want to be able to safely roll out new versions of your software in a resilient manner. So you want to run, update your API servers, let's say, one at a time. You want to wait for them to roll out. You don't want to have any downtime. And then what if something goes wrong? What if you set a flag that, it turns out, breaks some part of your control plane? You want to be able to roll back to the last known good state that you had. And while we're at it listing, you know, making our wish list here, what about advanced networking? What if you want to run some sort of network policies that constrain how your control plane talks to each individual component and to other parts of your cluster? What if you want to have role-based access control and auditing to control and keep track of your control plane, who it's talking to, what it's allowed to do. What about health checking, monitoring? If you're deploying Prometheus in your cluster, if you're looking at liveness checks and health checks, you want your control plane to have that too, to make sure that you know very quickly if there's a problem. And lastly, what about resource allocation and accounting? 
you don't want to waste compute by having Snowflake master nodes that aren't, aren't optimally using the resources. And you also might want to know, how much is my control plane costing to run? How many resources is it actually using? So if you think about it, what's really good at doing all this stuff? I mean, the obvious answer is Kubernetes itself, right? Wouldn't be great if we could just run our control plane this way. Something else that self-hosting unlocks is simplified node management. So if you think about a Kubernetes worker, so forget about masters for a second, what do you really need to run a Kubernetes worker? Well, you need the kubelet, right? That's what's going to talk to the API server and figure out which pod should be running. You need a container runtime, you know, Docker, Container D, Rocket, et cetera, that is actually going to run your pods. And you need some credentials to talk to the API server, you know, let's say a kubeconfig. And that's it, really. Most workers, that's what they, what they run. It's a very minimal subset of things compared to a master where you might be running specific API server controller manager, et cetera, system D units, if you will, or whatever else. So in a self-hosted world, this is all you need because everything is running in Kubernetes. Everything is really a worker. There's no distinction between a master and a worker from a compute point of view. So in that case, how do you select a master node? Well, it's actually just as simple as applying a label. The only difference between master and non-master nodes is that they happen to have labels on them. And so, again, using simple, uh, using the Kubernetes built-in primitives, it's simpler, it's more uniform, and it's more flexible. And I'll get into that a little bit later as well. Lastly, what about lifecycle management? What about upgrading your cluster, changing flags in your cluster, adding new, rotating your certs, let's say, for on your API server? Well, all you do is kubectl apply, kubectl edit, and you can go in and change anything, and then Kubernetes will roll out those changes in the way we all know and love. Now, realistically, you know, your control plane is your most important part of your Kubernetes cluster from you know, in one point of view. So you don't really want to be using kubectl in production, I would assume. So ideally, you'd actually want to automate this. Maybe you want to write some software that is using client Go to talk to the API server. You can encode a lot of logic and ex expertise into some program, maybe we call it an operator, that will manage your control plane, upgrade it, self-heal it, and so on. And I'll get into that in a little bit as well later. So that hopefully makes the case for why you might want to self-host, what some of the benefits would be. Now let's actually get into how it works. So when you want to create a self-hosted cluster, there's three main areas that you want to address in order to have something that's production ready, that is something you could actually use to run real workloads. The first is bootstrapping. How do you actually create a cluster? It's not, it's, if you start to think about it, it's actually not that easy. And then what about upgrades? I touched on it a little bit, but in practice, how does it work? How do you actually upgrade your whole control plane? And then disaster recovery. Inevitably, something will, can, things can and will go wrong. How do you make sure that a self-hosted cluster is recoverable? So I'll go through each, each of these one by one, and I'll actually jump over to the terminal and make a cluster and then break it for all of you, and we can see how this works. So the first step that we need to figure out is bootstrapping. How do you actually create a cluster from scratch? If you think about it, the control plane, as I illustrated earlier, is running as daemon sets and deployments, right? But you need a control plane to create daemon sets and deployments, right? You know, how can you say kubectl create if there's no API server to talk to? So here we have clever hack number one, which is that we're going to create a temporary static control plane to bootstrap a self-hosted cluster. In essence, we'll have a special ephemeral control plane that we can stand up, that we can point at our etcd instance that will be used in our production cluster, create our assets, and then tear down that cluster, and we're off, off to the races. How do you actually do this in practice? There are a few, few, few projects that are doing this. Uh, the one I'm going to talk to you today is called BootCube. Uh, it's a Kubernetes incubator project that I work on, and a few other people here. And the way it works is you give it temporary control plane manifests. So these are pod manifests that purely describe pods, because they need to run on the kubelet. There's no control plane yet. The kubelet only really knows how to run pods. So these are going to describe your API server, controller, and, uh, and scheduler. 
you also need your self-hosted control plane manifest. So this is actually going to describe your permanent self-hosted cluster once it gets running. And then lastly, you need an initial master node. And I put master here in parentheses because, as I said, there's nothing really special about the master node. It's just the node that we so happen to choose to be our initial node that we're going to bootstrap on. So BootCube is going to take these three inputs. They're just files on disk and then your node. And it's going to stand up a temporary control plane. And then it's going to pivot that into the self-hosted control plane. So let's actually launch a cluster and take a look at that. So here, can everyone see this OK? Cool. So I've, I've, got, I've got a few nodes sitting around here on my laptop. So let's look at the actual manifest we're going to use for a sec. So BootCube actually provides a nice little render tool that can create manifests that are good to, to they're kind of baseline to run a self-hosted cluster. If you want to go run your own, you can just download BootCube, play with this. In practice, you really want to customize these assets to match the specific configuration you want. But let's, so if we look at what we've got, oops. So we can see we've got a kube config up here. We've got these bootstrap manifests that I was talking about. So we've got an API server, controller manager, and scheduler, and those are just pods. And then we've got a bunch of other manifests, and this is actually our control plane that's going to run. So we've got API server, controller manager, scheduler. We've also got kube DNS, which is an add-on we, we, we like. It's got kube flannel, so we're actually deploying our network overlay as part of this self-hosted cluster. And then a few other things, our back rules and so on. And then we've got all our, all our PKI material that we're going to need to have a secure cluster. So if I hop over to my master node, you can see here I've copied over the assets already, and I have boot kube. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to say sudo boot kube start. And then I say use the assets in this directory. And what it's going to do is actually, if I open another terminal here, what it's done is it's copied these bootstrap manifests over to the kubelet manifest directory. So it's starting them up as, as static pods. And once that's, once that's done, it's going to use that temporary control plane to create the self-hosted assets. So since looking at text is not actually that enlightening, I'm going to illustrate this with pictures. And thanks to my coworker, Aaron, who originally made these really good slides. So here, here is just going to reflect what's going on in my terminal right now. We've got the kubelet, we've got boot kube, and we've got a CD. The first thing BootCube does is it creates static pods. It, as, as I showed, it's just by copying these static manifests over to the kubelet directory. And so we have an API server, scheduler, controller manager. Once they get up and running, they talk to etcd. You effectively have a functioning control plane. The kubelet is configured to look at this API server address. And so it actually joins the cluster. So we have this temporary control plane, and we have the kubelet. It's a one node cluster. BootCube detects that this cluster is up and running, and then it creates the self-hosted compo uh, components, effectively by calling kubectl create. And so the kubelet, since it's talking to the API server, sees that it should be running these pods. So it's going to start up the actual self-hosted API server, scheduler, and controller manager. But really, it's just functioning as a kubelet normally does, running a daemon set, deployment, et cetera. Once a self-hosted control plane is running, BootCube tears down the static pods. They're not needed anymore. It sees that the self-hosted cluster is running. And then BootCube itself exits. BootCube's done. We never use BootCube again in an ideal world. And the self-hosted cluster is now talking the same etcd instance, so that's the kind of trick that allowed us to use the temporary control plane and the final control plane and the pivot. And the kubelet now talks to this API server, and we have a one-node cluster. From there, we can start joining other nodes and expand our cluster accordingly. So let's go back, look at our cluster. OK, cool. It's, it's all done. We have all self-hosted control plane is successfully started. So boot kube exited. And we're done with it. So let's actually look at our cluster. So you can see we've got two nodes. We've got our master. And then I had a worker sitting around that was just waiting for an API server to appear. And then we actually have our control plane. So if we say, Kube system, get 
deployments. We've got our controller manager, scheduler, et cetera. Our daemon sets, we've got kube ABI server, flannel, kube proxy, et cetera. All right, cool. All right, so now we've got a cluster, but as we know in Kubernetes land, things are moving very fast, we want to upgrade it, right? How do we upgrade it? Well, this is probably the most boring slide of the talk. Actually, we just go and change the image in our daemon set. It's actually that easy. So I'm going to say kubectl edit. I might have to put that first. Daemon sets kube API server. All right. So I'm going to cheat. And we're saying, well, 185 came out, what, yesterday, two days ago? Let's, uh, let's upgrade to that. We want to be on the bleeding edge. Cool. Now let's uh, get daemon sets wide. So it's kind of hard to see when it's blown up. But you can see that uh, the kube API, kube API server has been upgraded to 185. And thanks to a daemon set rolling update strategy, it's going to do this in a safe, safe manner. And as I mentioned, we don't want to really be using kubectl edit on our production clusters possibly, but you can. In a pinch or in an emergency, you can go in and you can fix something this way. All right, the last piece I want to cover here is disaster recovery. So thing, things can and will do, go wrong with your cluster, either due to bugs, operator error, what have you. So what kind of failure modes might you see in a self-hosted cluster? First, you have partial control plane loss. Let's say that someone is editing their kube scheduler deployment, accidentally scales it down to zero, well, you've got a problem now because you can, you can scale it back up, but there's no scheduler there to decide which nodes the, the, it should be running on. So how do you deal with that? Well, in that case, you're going to have to recover, recover the scheduler itself. What about if you lose the whole control plane? Let's say you know, I have a bare metal cluster in my basement. I accidentally go and trip the fuse, and I start it back up. We need to restart things, right? So we'll have to recover the entire control plane. And lastly, you might lose the cluster completely. Let's say I accidentally delete my auto-scaling group in AWS. Well, hopefully you have backups, and you can recover from a backup. I'm going to make a brief interlude to talk about a pod check pointer. It's another thing that we use in self-hosting. So if some of you were, I, I know I went kind of fast, but a keen observer might have noticed a trick during the upgrade demo. I said it was easy. It is not actually that easy. How do you upgrade an API server? How do you actually handle master node reboots? Your API server, when I updated it, I have a single master cluster here. It's not actually what you want to do in the real world, but my little laptop, that's all I can handle. So when I updated the API server, you think about a daemon set. What it's going to do is it's going to terminate the old pod. And once it's fully terminated, start up a new pod. OK. We terminated the API server, then what? There's no API server. No, one, no one's telling us what to do next, right? So how did this work? Well, welcome to clever hack number two. We run a check pointer daemon. And this is actually running on all the masters. It's a pretty simple daemon. But what it does is for certain critical pods, it creates local checkpoints. It copies down the static manifest. And in the case of a control plane outage, it will actually deploy that manifest wait for the cluster to recover, and then on we go. And so during an upgrade, this is actually a mini outage that we're creating on purpose. And the check pointer is what allows us to do that upgrade by temporarily running a local API server, waiting for the new API, API server to start back up, and then decommissioning the checkpoint. So I can illustrate this in pictures. So let's say we have our kubelet and our API server. The check pointer is watching both. And it's basically just trying to reconcile. The API server says that pod 1 and 2 should be running. The kubelet says that pod 1 and 2 are running. So we're good. This is our steady state. The check pointer will create these in inactive checkpoints that are just on standby. Let's say pod 2 disappears from the kubelet. Let's say it's the API server. It's like this upgrade example we were just talking about. And it's not able to start a new one because there's no API server. We have this chicken and egg problem. The check pointer will see this. It will activate the static manifest the checkpoint, this pod will start. The, it's an API server, so now the kubelet can talk to it and decide, oh, I should be running an API server. So it'll actually run the real API server pod. The checkpointer sees, OK, 
API server and Kubelet are matching again, and it'll just retire the static pod. So pretty simple, but not obvious. And it helps us both in upgrades and in reboot situations. And then we're back to our steady state. The last piece here I want to talk about is recovery. So the checkpointer helps us in some cases, but not from all outages. For example, in the example I gave about scaling your scheduler down to zero, you don't have a functional control plane anymore, so you can't fix what's broken. You're gonna need, we need a bigger tool. So if only there was a way to jumpstart a cluster. Jumpstart sounds kind of like bootstrap. So clever hack number three comes in, which is we actually use BootCube to extract manifest from the cluster and then run another temporary control plane. So just like when we started the cluster the first time, we can do the same trick to create a control plane that's pointing at our same etcd, fix whatever's broken, and then on we go. So I'm gonna do a quick demo of this. We're going to uh, purposely break our cluster. So let's say kubectl and kubesystem. I did this earlier, that's probably easier. Okay, so we're gonna scale our kube scheduler to zero replicas, because why not? So if we say, you know, get pods, we see we've got two schedulers that are terminating. That's bad news. Let's wait for them to go away. Okay, they're gone. Well, oops, I didn't really mean to schedule it to two. Maybe I meant 10 or something. Sorry, zero, I meant 10. So let's scale it back up. Okay, that worked, right? API server said, sure, that's what you want to do. But then it's going to ask the scheduler to schedule those pods. And uh-oh, we don't have a scheduler. All we have is uh, pending pods. They're not going to get scheduled, right? So what do we do? We can use Buku Recover. So let's hop to the server, back to our master really quick. And so we can say bootcube recover. And then we say recovery dir is home core recover. And then kube config, because it needs to talk to the API server. In this case, we still have an API server. Etsy, Kubernetes, kube config. All right, so this talked to the API server, and it recreated these bootstrap manifests, because if you think about the ones we used to start the cluster, that's a one-time thing. This could be a year later. Our cluster is very different. We can't reuse those assets, but this one is going to create boot kube start-friendly assets, so we boot kube start it. Let's boot kube start, and this time we say the asset dir is home, sorry, home cluster recover. Oh, sorry, core recover, thank you. All right, so it's the same process. It's gonna create a temporary control plane. As soon as that happens, we're gonna have a scheduler. It's gonna be able to schedule the missing schedule pods and we're, we're good again. That's just gonna take a second for the kubelet to take care of this. So, while that's recovering, and I'll check on it in a second, I wanna talk about what's next for self-hosting. Self-hosting is a good place. As I mentioned, Tectonic is CoreOS distribution. We're using self-hosting in production today, lots of clusters. It's stable and great and has all these nice properties I talked about. But it also unlocks a lot of interesting things we can do to kind of take our cluster management to the next level. So one is automated operations. There's a lot of things you can do now that these are Kubernetes objects that you can manage using the Kubernetes API. One is cluster upgrades. As I said before, you don't really want to be using kubectl apply, right? You want to maybe use client go, encode some logic, and specifically you want to have kind of fine-grained control over ro rollout, ordering. It turns out you're, you really want to upgrade your API server first, then your scheduler, controller manager, and lastly your kubelets once everything else is okay. You also want to maybe handle some pre and post upgrade operations, turning on a new flag, updating some credentials, things like that. You can encode this in an operator. Also, kubelet upgrades. So how do you actually upgrade a kubelet? Well, it, that's one thing that is running statically on each machine, but what, why don't we just deploy a daemon set that can actually run on every machine and make the necessary changes? It could you know, RPM or deb install. And lastly, configuration management. As, as we know, things change over time. We might want to change our cluster. Ideally, we don't want to have to tear down our cluster and make a new one. So one thing we can do is 
actually have our operator go in and change flags and do the right coordination. It, could be, it, might, it might be a nuanced process, but it's something you can encode in software, and it's much less error prone that way. We can even do things like deploying a new network overlay or changing your network settings. This is something that we actually do at CoreOS. So actually, a lot of these automated operations are things that Tectonic does, uh, but there are other things that, that we're still kind of adding every day. Similarly, we talked about node management, how that's simpler, but it also, by having these unified nodes, it unlocks a lot of power as well. One is self-healing. So I just did a boot kube recover manually. That's also not ideal. I had to SSH to the machine. I had to run some commands. What if there were node agents that, if the operator senses that there's a control plane problem, could remotely invoke boot kube recover or something equivalent to heal your control plane? Or what about auto-scaling? You could increase the number of masters if you're experiencing higher load or if your requirements increase over time. Or what about if, since all nodes are the same, anytime your auto-scaler adds a new node, it talks to the operator and says, hey, I'm a new node. What should I be? Should I be a master? Should I be a worker? Should I have some other specialized role? Right? Since all nodes are the same, they can be provisioned as anything. And lastly, node identity. So in recent Kubernetes versions, something called TLS bootstrapping was added, which allows every node to have a, a unique identity by performing a challenge and response with the API server when it joins the cluster. And so since our nodes are simple and have very little state, they can use this very nicely. And we're very close to actually merging this into BootCube. Should be in hopefully next week. So let's just check, check back in our cluster a sec. Yeah, it's back. So let's, let's look at our uh, pods here. And yes, our scheduler is back. We're happy. Cool. So BootCube is a, a Kubernetes incubator project. And Tectonic is CoreOS's specific distribution of Kubernetes. But we are trying to also get this support actually in upstream so that more Kubernetes users can access it. So KubeADM, which is the upstream tool for deploying clusters, is adding Kubernetes support, is self-hosted Kubernetes support. It's almost done. I think you can actually launch clusters now, and upgrading is coming next. The checkpointer, instead of being a standalone pod, is actually being added to the kubelet itself. And that is already done for pods, and we're just adding support for secrets, which is necessary for the API servers the way we run them. But as always, we need help. If you're interested in this kind of stuff, if you're interested in coming up with more clever hacks, check out SIG Lifecycle. You can join, see us on Slack or our mailing list and come to our weekly meetings. So that's all I've got. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions if anyone has anything. And thank you so much for coming. All right, I think. Does this work? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Um, in the beginning, where was your etcd cluster? Ah, good question. And, so, and how do you feel about self-hosting etcd itself? Right. So uh, my etcd cluster is running on a separate node, just natively. Self-hosting etcd is something we've worked on. It, we've actually uncovered a lot of bugs in the API server as a result in terms of connections, because when you're running the self-hosted etcd on the pod network and they're moving around a lot, it turns out the API server is not actually resilient at reconfiguring these connections. It, it, it just was something that we never exposed before. So we're working on trying to kind of fix HA for self-hosted etcd, and then we'll reevaluate re whether that's something to do. I think it's something that makes a lot of people nervous, because that's Oh, etcd is kind of the baseline building block. But on the other hand, you can launch self-hosted etcd clusters for use not for your control plane, and that works really nicely. So it's something we've, it, it's experimental. Actually, in BootCube, you can use it, but we know, there's some known issues with it that we're trying to fix upstream in the API server. Sorry if you can pass it to someone. Uh, so, hey, so uh, what if we want to upgrade Kubernetes versions Mm -hmm. uh, so, like, we need to uh, down our whole cluster, right? Uh, if I want to update from 1.8 to 1.9. Uh, you don't have to do that. Uh, if with, with Tectonic, we are able to upgrade from 1.6 to 1.7 and 1.7 to 1.8 with no downtime, just rolling update exactly as I showed. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, what are the bare 
requirements that you need. I, 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 you might have done it. I, I missed it. Um, in order to get, you need to run the kublet directly on the node, right? That's mm -hmm. not obviously you can't self-host the kublet in the kublet. We tried, but <laughs> that one was a little, little too tricky. And um, uh, adding new nodes to the like, I guess it doesn't matter where the control pane runs, or it's a daemon set. So uh, I, I'm also right. confused about the the proxy. Because right. I thought that has to run on the node and yes. flannel also. Yes. So I kind of lighted this for time, but the so we, we run the control plane on nodes that are labeled as master nodes, mm -hmm. right? So we set we label the nodes, we set selectors on our control plane, and we set taints on those nodes so that other workloads don't run on them. Mm -hmm. And then for the API server and kube proxy, yes, those need to have network connectivity. So that's why they run as daemon sets using host networking. But the controller manager and the scheduler were able to run as deployments. Since they but doesn't that. Flannel have to have access to the host devices? The host sure, yeah. It, it, well, it uses CNI, right? So it actually just talks to the kubelet and is able to deploy the, uh, the plugins, oh, okay. and that's it. And the, the proxy is the same way, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yep. Very cool. So the only binary that you need to run directly on the node is um, the kubelet itself? That's right. I think we might be out of time. One more question. Is anyone? Oh, or, uh, okay. Let me, sorry. A clarification on the snapshotter. Is it necessary in case of breakdown of communication with the control plane? Or if there is a breakdown and the node reboots and then the kubelet doesn't know what to start? So the check pointer runs conservatively. It's basically trying to reconcile the state between the last time it talked to the API server and what it's seeing on the kubelet, which it can always see because it's running on the kubelet itself. So if the API server is down, or if there's a network, uh, a network partition or something, it'll do the conservative thing. But in Kubernetes land, that's what you want, right? It's, if you're running an extra pod, theoretically, that'd be OK. You don't, you don't want to run kinds of workloads where an ex you, you can only have exactly one pod. So I mean, if I, if I just lose my control, lose my control plane, mm -hmm. um, like the connectivity to the API server, then will I instantly lose my pods because the kubelet is going to be like, oh, I this, I don't know what to do, or? No, that's not okay. the way the kubelet works. Okay. It, the kubelet will keep running what it's running. Yeah. But it's more, yes, if it reboots or right. okay, something else happens. Thanks. Cool. How about right. the links between uh, permanent control plane and temporary? Well, what do you mean the mix? Maybe you can hand you the mic really quick. Having both. Yes. Uh, temp uh, sorry. A permanent control plane, yes. and what we're seeing uh, right now, the best of, of both worlds, correct? Well, the temporary control plane is, as the name implies, temporary, right? It's only used when you are starting your cluster or recovering it. Right, but having a permanent control plane and self-hosted control plane, both. Yes. How about that? Well. But if you're maintaining a permanent control plane, then you lose, you, you, you have double the overhead, and you don't have the benefits of self-hosted control plane in terms of management and stuff, right? So if you're having, maintain, having to maintain both, it's almost asked, well, what's, what's the point in that case, mm, right? Okay. Because the, the part of the idea is this is simplifying the management of control plane. Right. Thank you. Cool. Thanks very much.